Captains of Industry, brought to you by Airtel. Hello and warmth. Welcome to this edition of Captains of Industry. Now, IBM celebrates 100 years this 2011. It's a milestone, but it's also telling of how big the digital divide is between Africa and the rest of the world. Computing, electronics and data services are the mainstay of how Western economies work. Something, is, uh, it lags somewhere here in Africa. Consider that it's only now that the major stock exchanges are going electronic in major economic hubs on the continent. As Africa grows and economies look to run more efficiently, IBM has a definite role to play. So in celebrating 100 years of innovation is the head of IBM Sub-Saharan Africa, Oliver Fortain, and he's our captain of industry. Tonight, Oliver, thanks so much for your time. I've just painted this, this very real problem of the digital divide. I know people are now talking about digital inclusivity and why Africa is still held back in many ways. What's your view? I think it's, it's, uh, it's true that Africa has been held back and, and for all the reasons we understand. Um, mostly uh, predicated by economic reasons. Uh, I think it's also true that uh, Africa is very much uh, joining the, the economic world and the digital world. And I think the good thing for Africa is that it doesn't have the legacy uh, you know, built in inherently that uh, more mature markets would have. So I think there's a good side to the story as well. Now, increasingly, because Africa has been held back, the opportunity is that we're revolutionizing on the ICT front, and we've leapfrogged a lot of technologies, mm -hmm. and we're very much in the wireless space. So then when I look at IBM, I ask, what's the relevance then of an IBM today? That's a, that's a good question. As you said at the start of the show, we're 100 years old, and, um, and really that 100 years has been achieved through constant innovation. So we're a company that innovates, um, and we really want to innovate uh, where it matters. Um, and I'll give you a couple of good examples, but, but your example is a very good one of, you know, um, if you look at the African continent, it's predominantly wireless mm. uh, and not fixed line infrastructure, which mm. is fantastic. It's enabled mm. a leap of technology. And I think we're going to see a lot of that. A lot of the emerging technologies that allow those leaps, uh, you know, are still uh, being developed. You know, mm. so, so the companies that are innovating and spending money on R&D are the companies bringing those technologies about. Mm. And IBM is very much at the forefront of that. We spend in excess of $6 billion a year doing uh, research and development. People say, you know, it's the <coughs> end of the computer. Wireless is king. You know, as you talk about innovation, what does that mean? Are we going to see a completely different kind of company going forward? Um, I, I think that what will happen, I, I believe that IBM at its core will stay the same. Um, I believe that the way that we service our customers will change uh, and that will be part of the innovation. So part of the innovation will be business model innovation mm -hmm. uh, or go to market innovation mm -hmm. and obviously product innovation uh, remains important. Uh, but when you talk about you know, the end of computers, well you know, computers are fairly complex and actually your cell phone is a computer. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and people talk about convergence. Mm. So how technology is converging with, you know, more, um, uh, you know, more sort of mundane day-to-day -day things to, to uh, embed intelligence in those things. Mm. And that's allowing us to do some very clever things. Um, we are, our go-to-market strategy today is something called Smarter Planet. And yeah. Smarter Planet is predicated on, on the fact that the world is becoming smarter, but our problems are also becoming more complex. Mm. And so, you know, when we, when we bring those things together intelligently, that's when we're going to get the, the best result. Before we talk about that uh, smarter planet agenda, I mean, when we look at the fact that cell phone companies are now deriving a big chunk of their revenues from data services, sure. they still need uh, collaboration with uh, traditional producers of hardware, uh, traditional uh, producers of fixed line, uh, yes. telephony, that sort of thing. For you, where's the collaboration? I know that you've gone into a big major partnership with Airtel in Kenya as they start to be more competitive in that space. What does that mean for you? Yeah, so the, the collaboration um, specifically in, in the case of Airtel is obviously where we have strength, which is running efficient IT operations. Um, but we are collaborating as well on um, their strategic drives and where they're trying to grow. So without saying too much specifically <laughs> about Airtel, which I'm sure Trade be secrets, I like this. Uh -huh. um, you know, we, we are as a business under the umbrella of Smarter um, looking at ways that business uh, can optimize or go to market in a different way. Not our business, but banking or telco mm. or health or, mm. you know, the, the notion of Smarter doesn't stop with, let's say, a city. 
Mm. Um, it, it very much is in the in the business world, and every single company, every large company, struggles with its supply chain. Mm. As an example, mm. the more you optimize, the more you build an intelligence, the better the data you have coming out of your supply chain, mm. the likelier you are to be able to optimize and save cost. As one example, you know. So, so as a company, we're very focused on those things. We're very focused on how do we make a difference to business. How do you make a difference to Africa? Let's talk about the Smarter Planet agenda and what yeah. it is that you're trying to do. Uh, my summation is you're trying to make African cities modern and work efficiently. So it's everything across the spectrum, infrastructure, utilities, water, yes. healthcare. What does that mean in that broader integration of bringing out a new Africa, a yeah. modern Africa? Yeah, it's, it's a, you know, Africa suffers all the same things that the rest of the world is suffering. So rapid urbanization, it's happening quickly. The world's very focused on Africa as, as the next growth engine, yeah. um, you know, and, 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 and that's a good thing. Uh, but it does mean that there is a demand uh, from people investing into Africa for certain services, goods, products, and so on. Um, our, our focus very much is to get Africa and where we operate in Africa. I think it's a bit arrogant to say that, you know, we can we can transform Africa, we yeah. can't, but we can play a role. Yeah. Our focus very much is to start to introduce those technologies in a context that make an immediate impact. So, so urbanization, as, as an example, is putting massive pressure on large cities in Africa. Mm. It doesn't matter where you go in Africa, mm. whether you go to Egypt or you go to Lagos. Kenya or you go to Lagos in Nigeria, right? the same issues are happening. They, they have traffic issues, they have uh, security issues, mm. they have water issues, sanitation issues. These issues are all the same, and technology makes a massive difference. The, the good thing for Africa, as we said before, is it's not burdened by legacy infrastructure. Mm. So we can pretty much go straight to smart infrastructure. We can build today infrastructure with technology embedded that tells us the best optimal route for traffic to take, mm. to start proactively managing mm. traffic, to, you know, to analyze um, crime hotspots in a city and deploy policing accordingly. You know, we can do that today, mm. and I think um, from an Africa perspective, as Africa and Africa will, because yeah. you know, because there is such a big drive in African growth, Africa will take its rightful place economically. Um, the great thing is that we have an opportunity to go straight to the the best infrastructure that supports that. I want you to simplify that text. Everything you've just done s it sounds to me like you've been speaking to IBM customers. I want you to tell me. When we start talking about smarter cities right. or introducing smarter grids, yes. what does that mean for my life? I live a nice suburban life in Johannesburg. Yes. I don't want to deal with the traffic. I live in four ways. Yes. Uh, it burdens me when I have to come to work early in the morning because I have that traffic problem. I'm yes. going into hospital soon. How do all those things work better for me using your technology? Right, so, so smart grids is actually a good one, right? So um, we, we went through a period a couple of years ago where uh, you didn't know if your electricity was going to be on or yeah. off, yeah. and uh, we still have uh, um, instances of Eskom having to do some load shedding, either in favour of industry or. Um, but but if you have um, smart technologies like utility load management, that will switch off those parts of the grid that actually aren't using the grid. They're sitting there drawing energy, and it's wasteful. Um, if you have those technologies, especially in the home, for things like geysers and heaters and you know, um, appliances that actually draw a lot of power, if you could switch those off at peak hour when they're unproductive, you take a massive load off the grid. Mm. So if Eskom was to deploy that, you know, they could probably take out the equivalent of building out a, a new power station as an example. Mm. That would be one concrete example. Another concrete example, I mean, I, I live in four ways as well, so, <laughs> so I'm, with you the, I'm with you on the traffic, <laughs> right? But, but you've seen that the, the one change, which is an infrastructure change, which was um, rebuilding the interchange over the motorway, yes. William Nickel yes. and the motorway, that's made a massive difference, right? It probably takes a good 30 minutes off your peak hour traffic yeah. time. Um, and it's a very simple change. But actually, um, the technology exists today to, 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 to do much smarter stuff in terms of redirecting traffic, mm. in terms of, you know, we could probably have gotten the same impact as we did with that interchange mm. just through clever deployments of technology. Mm. Um, and then when you get to healthcare, which is, you know, which is a, a critical agenda mm. f item for for the country, um, skills is a big issue for us. And if you can put the technologies in place that puts a skill technician, which let's say it takes three to four years to, to build up that skill, mm -hmm. as opposed to a very skilled doctor who takes 10 to 13 years to build up, uh, into the field and make them as effective for practical purposes mm -hmm. as that doctor would be, 
the impact on rural health care, as an yeah. example, is tremendous. Right? Okay, so. I'm, I'm, I'm satisfied. Under your tenure, IBM is pursuing a very aggressive drive into emerging markets, expansion into the frontiers like Nigeria, Kenya, and the new frontiers like uh, Angola, for instance. Just tell us about that. Yes. So we took a decision two years ago that, um, that Africa's time had come. Mm -hmm. We believe that firmly, and, and so we took a decision to invest heavily. Um, we obviously had to choose a number of countries. Um, and we chose the ones you've just mentioned. Um, plus Senegal. Plus Senegal, plus Ghana, uh, and plus Tanzania. So those were the, the first six we chose in sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, subsequently, with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with the Bati contract, uh, we've opened up a whole bunch of new countries. Mm -hmm. So in Africa, we are now at 20 legal entities. Um, and, the, and the drive is um, you know, twofold. One, um, you have to get to market early. Yeah. If you're going to shape um, how that market perceives yeah. technology and acquires technology and so on, you have to get to market early. So it was a time to market uh, factor. And, and as I say, the f fact that we believe that the, ac the African growth mm -hmm. story is being written now. It's not going to happen in 20 years' time. It's busy happening. You know, everybody always says Africa's not for sissies. We've heard that across right. the board. Yes. But you've also got to be open-minded yes. when you go into Africa because it's not one cultural right. um, monolith. Nigerians are very different people from Angolans. Yes. In language, in conduct, in every other thing. The only common denominator is oil. So when you enter these markets, given those kinds of differences, what sort of mindset do you embrace? Well, I, I think we made a few mistakes going in, <laughs> and, um, and we've learned from those. Um, but, but you know, culture and local knowledge are, are, are vitally important. Um, I, I do think those markets are opening up. And you often hear people say, well, it's a relationship-based market. But every market's a relationship-based market. Um, African customers are actually no different to South African customers or American customers. They demand value for the money they spend. Mm. They demand good service. Mm. You know, the banks in Nigeria are strengthening governance every single day. They're, taking, they're making big strides towards strengthening governance. And if you look at, uh, across Africa now, the level of transparency we have today, we haven't had you know, f mm. uh, forever. So, um, so operating in Africa, I think, is becoming is becoming simpler. Is by no means simple. Yeah. Um, and the lessons we've learned is that if you don't operate in a local context, you're going to fail. I mean, you say you made a few mistakes, and I yeah. think that's humility on your part. As a leader, how do you go about rectifying mistakes early on? Because you don't want to create a situation where you're in crisis management as you're trying to tap into a new market. Yeah. Now that that's that's true enough. Uh, I. I think the ability to actually stand back and say, you know, have we gone too far with this uh, is important. Um, we, we were lucky because we were sort of starting out on the journey, so there was some latitude. There's an expectation that when you try something new, you'll, you know, you'll break a few eggs along the way. Yeah. Um, so I, I'd say we were never really at too much risk by admitting that we made a few mistakes. Yeah. But those, uh, admitting that we've made the mistakes, um, rectifying them, and then embracing those you know, um, the, those things into what we do now yeah. has been powerful because we've learned from our mistakes. All right, we're going to continue with our conversation after the break. Our guest tonight is IT guru Oliver Fortain. He's the head of IBM for Sub-Saharan Africa. The company is in its centennial year and it's in that capacity that he's here tonight. Just telling us about their forays into the rest of Africa. He's also going to tell us about diving deep under his love for the water. Stay with us.